Hello, welcome to New Albany Baptist Church online service. We hope this will bring you peace, hope, and encouragement. It's really neat that people all over the world are able to view this. In case you're wondering, we're located in New Albany, Pennsylvania, in the United States of America. If you're viewing this through YouTube, please visit our website at www.newalbanybaptist.com to listen to the many sermons already posted. And in case you miss them, you can see our Palm and Easter Sunday services. Also, if you would like, you may make a donation directly through our website to help support our church and the many services we provide for our community and elsewhere. Hi, we've been looking at the seven claims of Jesus to be the I am of life. And we began two weeks ago with the subject of bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger in John 6, 35. As we looked at that, he's more than enough for all of our daily needs. And then last week, we looked at Jesus' claim that he's the light of the world in John chapter 8 and verse 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And today, we want to look at the third claim in the I Am series of Jesus. He says, I am the gate or the door. In John chapter 10 and verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved or delivered and will go in and out and find pasture. So that concept of the gate is fa fascinating. It's interesting because it deals with the shepherding aspect of uh, a local shepherd, say in Jerusalem or in the surrounding area. And I want to tell you a little bit about how this worked because there's some differences. But he says, I am the gate. If anyone enters through me or I am the door, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So the design from Jesus is that life would be meaningful and safe. And safe is a really important concept in our present day and age. I want to contrast the shepherd's care, the care that Jesus is talking about in this illustration, with those who simply don't care. Now, Jesus is talking about the religious leaders of his day, those who were the establishment religion, those who had control and were able to manipulate people. Uh, and basically, his conclusion is they didn't care about the people. They only cared about themselves. And Jesus wanted to demonstrate the care of God the Father as our shepherd. And so I want to contrast that shepherd's care with those who don't care. In fact, Jesus went on and he said, those who are those religious leaders who are entrenched in their mentality uh, about organized religion, they are not good shepherds. The Pharisees of the day, the Sadducees of the day, they were only protecting their, their political and religious privileges. And he said, those are the people who would steal and rob from the average person, from the common person, from the person who wants faith and needs faith. So we've been contrasting the shepherd's care with those who really don't care, the religious leaders. And John 10 verse 1 says, Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. I want to focus for a moment on this expression. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, if you were in Jerusalem or in any of the uh, towns in Israel where there would be sheep pens and shepherds. There would be the regular shepherd, but then there would also be sort of a, a gatekeeper. 
Now, Jesus is not talking about himself at this point being the gatekeeper. He's the shepherd at this point, and we'll look at that next week. However, what happens is that as the shepherd, he would come to a gate uh, or a sheep pen, and there would be various herds in there. And they would be all together, and there would be someone who would open the gate for him, and he would go to his herd. It's different when they're out in the pastoral countryside, and we're going to see that in just a moment. But what happens is the shepherd comes for the sheep. The sheep know this shepherd. He gathers them together, and the gatekeeper knows the shepherd, and so he opens this gate in a regular uh, sheep pen setting. And he calls his sheep by name and then leads them out. We pick up the passage in John chapter 10 and verse 4, and it's talking again about this shepherd. When he has brought out all his own, that is his sheep, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. In ancient Israel as it is today, um, sheep won't follow uh, the voice of another shepherd. They won't follow the voice of someone who is not their own. Sheep are not the smartest creatures on the planet. They don't defend themselves. Uh, they, they don't know how to uh, sort of hide away or run away. They group together uh, in, in a bunch, in a flock, and uh, they're uh, an easy prey for wolves and other um, preying creatures. And so they need protection. They always need protection. And Jesus uses this illustration, not that we're helpless, not that we're not in, created in God's image, uh, not that we're not talented and capable, but when it comes to our spirituality, God protects us. Uh, he, he wants us to be uh, like sheep. Uh, he has said, Jesus said that uh, we ought to be, when we deal with our world and our situation, we ought to be as wise as serpents and gent, excuse me, gentle as doves, as wise as serpents and gentle as doves. So he expects us to use our minds. He expects us to do uh, the, the, the smart thing, uh, the, the uh, right thing, but he also knows that we need protection. And so his sheep follow him. Uh, we, we have a, an interesting illustration. We used to have goats on our property here. My wife fell in love with goats and we had many uh, baby goats born on our property. At one time we had about 20 or so goats. And it was interesting because they would always flock around the house. In fact, I had to put barriers up because they would be into everything. But evening time would come and she would take uh, the, uh, the, the food for the goats and she would walk down the hill to where the goat stall was and they would, they knew, and they would follow her, and she would call them, and they would respond uh, completely to her, and she just, she just had a way with these goats. Well, a shepherd is the same way. He says, verse 5, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. This is Jesus talking again. And then in verse 6 of chapter 10, it says, Jesus used this figure of speech but somehow the Pharisees didn't understand what he was telling them because they weren't shepherds. They were thieves and robbers. They were interested in their own agenda, not interested in helping God's people. And sadly, this had gone on for quite a long while. Now, the difference I started to explain in sheep pens, and the difference is between regular pens that are in town where you normally would have your sheep kept. And then in the summer months uh, and the spring and when it was, was nice weather, that these shepherds would take their sheep and they would go out to uh, pasture lands. And there were things called, are uh, known as pasture pen, uh, pens. And what that might be is a cave. Uh, it might be uh, a rock structure that was either rectangular or circular. They're, they have them all over uh, Israel and, and the Middle East. Uh, but they were different. The regular pens would have a series of pens and, and uh, uh, one gatekeeper, but these would be just the shepherd with his flock, and he would perhaps find a place in the rocks or in a cave, 
and they were pasture pens. So when they were feeding out in the pasture, they would then put them in these pens at night, and there was no door on these pens usually. What would happen is the shepherd would lie down in the entryway after the sheep were all in, and he would become the door, or he would become the gate. And this is why Jesus is saying, I am the gate. Uh, he is the one who puts the sheep, you and I, in his safe haven, and then he protects us from anything that would bother his sheep. And we pick it up in John chapter 10 and verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, this is the second time, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers. Now, did Jesus mean the prophets of old? Did he mean Isaiah? Did he mean Jeremiah? No, he meant all the false teachers, all the people who had a religious agenda, that they came just to rip people off. And we're going, going to see more about that in a moment. Uh, their motive was, you know, could they get rich on religion? Could they uh, just kind of make themselves comfortable with this? Or would they really be shepherds? Would they really care? Would they grieve over people who are struggling and who are hurting? And so he says, those who have come before, who are part of the religious establishment, they're basically thieves and robbers. Pretty strong statements from Jesus. But he says, but the sheep have not listened to them. And then he says in verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved, will be delivered, will be safe, will have a safe haven. They will come in and go out, and they will find pasture. What a life to be able to move in and out and find rest and peace in the whole, if you look at Psalm 23, the Psalm of David, who was also a shepherd, it, it's all about saying, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, I will lack nothing. He leads me beside still waters. Incidentally, it's interesting because sheep will not drink water that is moving. It has to be still water or they won't, or they won't drink it. it. It scares them for some reason. They're afraid of it and they won't touch it. And so here's this loving shepherd in Psalm 23, and David knows this story, and he takes them by these still waters, these quiet, calm waters, so that they can have something to drink. And then he concludes with this in John 10:10. 10, 10. I have come that they may have life, talking about his sheep, talking about all people who express faith. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. In other translations, it says that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I like that translation, that our lives are not just these tiny little uh, microscopic, no joy kind of expressions. They are uh, filled with life life on this earth and life for uh, the future to come. And that's the way a Christian should live. That's the way faith is designed. That's the way our great shepherd, God the Father and Jesus, look at us and want us to live. There are a lot of people who think, oh, you know, if I'm religious, I'm miserable, right? It means there's a whole bunch of rules and regulations and do's and don'ts. And man, I don't want that. Well, listen, when I came to Christ when I was 15 years of age, I didn't want that either. There was too much fun to have in life. There, was, there were too many joys in life. And I thought, if this is the kind of God, you know, what I saw a lot of times in organized religion, if this is the kind of God that just basically says, no, 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 you can't do this, you can't do that, then there's something wrong with that. And Jesus said just the opposite. Now, he doesn't let us do anything we want. We can't live any way we want. We have to live by the guidance of the Good Shepherd. But the reality is, he says, I've come so that your life might be meaningful, so that it might be full, that it might be the best life you could possibly have on this earth and for eternity. And so I came that it might be more abundant than what you're, you're experiencing right now. Because quite frankly, by religion and religious leaders, you're probably getting ripped off. Uh, I know that's a strong expression, but that's what Jesus said to the religious leaders. That's what he said to the Pharisees and others. Now, a conflict arose and continued to arise between the religious leaders and Jesus. And John 10, verse 24, we skip down a little bit, shows that conflict. The Jews who were there gathered around him 
saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? Now, they haven't figured out this mystery of the Good Shepherd and who the thieves are and who the robbers are yet. And they said uh, to Jesus, they're all gathered around him, how long will you keep us in suspense? You talk about being the gate, you talk about being the door, you talk about being the shepherd. And then they ask him this question, if you are the Messiah, and that was a, a Hebrew expression, uh, they expected the Messiah, they expected a political Messiah to overthrow Rome and, and, and to put the Pharisees in power, but that's not what Jesus came for. He says, if, they say, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered in verse 25, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. All the evidence is there about my Father, and that's the whole argument of the, the book of John, uh, the signs and the wonders that Jesus did to, to verify that he came from the Father and that he indeed was the Messiah and is the Messiah. And verse 26, he says, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. In other words, because they rejected the shepherd, because they wouldn't have him shepherd them, they didn't believe. And he said, you don't understand, and you're looking for something else, and I told you I'm the Messiah, but you don't believe because you don't have the eyes to believe. You don't have the heart to believe. And we pick it up in John chapter 10 and verse 27, and again, he contrasts it. He says, by contrast, my sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. There's this promise of eternal life, and they will never perish. And then I love this. There are people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and then they look at their behaviors, and they think to themselves, oh, because I made this mistake, because I failed, because of this sin, God doesn't love me anymore, and he's kicking me out of the kingdom. Well, in verse 29, it says, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. So there's no greater power than God the Father who put sheep in the hand of Jesus simply through faith. And he says, no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. Let me ask you a question. When he says no one, does that mean I can take myself out of the father's hand? There are some people who teach that. It's just not in the Bible. It's just not biblical. If you didn't get into a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you didn't get salvation based on works, then you can't work your way out of it. It's sort of like this. You might have a spat with God. You might have a difficulty with God. Um, when my daughter and son were growing up, there were times when we had disagreements. But you know what? What I would do, the first time we had a disagreement, I would go over to the filing cabinet in my office, and I would pull out their birth certificate, and I would rip it in half, because I would say, you no longer are part of this family. I'm kicking you out. Well, you know that's ridiculous. I would never do that. I love my children, and we have a great relationship. And the reality of it is you, you don't do that. You don't, just because you have a difference, just because you fall out of favor for a short time, that doesn't mean that you're not part of that family. And God says, nobody can snatch them out of my father's hands. Jesus said that. And not only that, you don't get kicked out of the family just because you make a mistake because you didn't get into the family because of your works. And God's very, very clear on this. And then Jesus says, I and my Father are one. We're one. We're the same. We're part of the Trinity together. Different roles, different functions, but all part of the same Godhead. John chapter 10 and verse 31, again, the Jews come back and his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. That happened back in uh, John chapter 8 as well. And the reason we're going to find out in a moment is the same reason in John chapter 8. But John chapter 10 verse 31 says, again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? And they replied, we are not stoning you for any good work, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So they understood his claim. They understood that claim back in, in John chapter 8 as well. He is making himself God. And either Jesus is a lunatic or he's true in what he says. And you know what? If I thought for a moment that Jesus was nuts, 
If I thought for a moment that he was either a liar, a deceiver, or a lunatic, I would stop following him in a moment. But scripture bear out what Jesus promised. He is the Messiah, and he did claim that. And only crazy people claim that, or people who are indeed who they say they are, as Jesus said he was. But for blasphemy, because you're a mere man, they couldn't understand it. They didn't want to be his sheep. So here's my challenge to you. Are you getting ripped off by religion? Are you getting ripped off by organized religion? And I'm not talking about different denominations or, or uh, different branches of Christianity or whatever. I'm talking about uh, a system. And sadly, whether you're talking in the uh, Christian realm or some other realm, and Christianity has made certainly a lot of mistakes, but there are, like in the Jewish circles, there were Pharisees who were ripping people off. Jesus said they were thieves, they climb over the side of the fence, and they come in to rob and to steal. And religion hasn't changed, sadly. Now, I'm not saying all religion is this way, and I'm not saying that we're right and everybody else is wrong, but what I'm saying is that when you go back to the Bible and you go back to the words of Jesus, Jesus wanted us to have an abundant life. He didn't want us to get ripped off. And so I come back to John chapter 9, John chapter 10 and verse 9, where he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. That kind of life that's a free, freeing life. And then he says in verse 10 of chapter 10, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. Has that been your experience in life? You know, whether, whether it's the government ripping you off or somebody else ripping you off, and I'm not, a, I'm not a, you know, fearful about those things. I, I believe what Jesus said, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Uh, I believe that the government is put in a place to protect those who follow Christ and, and do good, but that doesn't mean that they're perfect. And religious institutions have not been perfect either. And people have been getting ripped off for a long, long time. And Jesus said, that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart. And for me as a pastor, that breaks my heart too. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, have it to the full the way God intended it. I hope that's your experience today. I hope you feel such peace at the fact that Jesus is bread of life, that he's the light of the world, and that he's the gate or the door for your safekeeping. Would you join me as we close in prayer? Our Lord, our God, we give you thanks for all that Jesus is. Help people to stop getting ripped off by religion. That's a terrible, terrible thing. And Lord, you will hold every dishonest religious leader accountable. And we're not perfect, Lord. We know that. We're only forgiven. We cannot lose our salvation once we put our faith in Jesus Christ because no one, no one, not even ourselves, can take us out of your hands. No one can take us away from the Good Shepherd. So we give you thanks for that. And thank you for the privilege of having the abundant life and worshiping you. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus.
Join us every Sunday at www.NewAlbanyBaptist.com for services with Pastor Terry Van Horn and guest musicians. The website also has sermons already posted and gives information about our church and the ministries that we provide. Thank you for joining us. Please join us again next week for another message. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again next week.